All right, it looks like we are all here. Welcome everyone to EduSmart's professional development series. I very much recognize that you all are most probably busier than humanly possible at this point. So the fact that you all take time out of your day to come join us really, really warms my heart. So thank you all for joining us. I guarantee you that this presentation um, that Lisa's put together for you all is going to be worth your time and more. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce to you our, to our star of the hour, Lisa, I'm the president of Lisa's fan club. Lisa is a superstar for many reasons. She is the coolest cat on the block. Uh, she has done everything in the intersection of education and science, from being a teacher, from writing curriculum, from being a department chair, online certificate, certification teacher, virtual school curriculum designer, and so much more. We have a jam-packed session here for you, which is very relevant to all of the changes that are happening in education right now. So please give your warmest welcome to our one and only Lisa. Thank you, Devanshi. <laughs> and I wanna say, uh, just getting started, that um, feel free to type questions into the chat because this is all about asking questions. And uh, Devanshi is gonna keep me up to date on those, but you are also more than welcome to unmute yourself uh, and just ask me a question directly. So today I titled this session, Phenomenal Science, um, Anchoring Learning to Student Questions. So. Uh, for those of you that are from Texas, we've, he we've heard a lot of new, uh, the buzzword about teaching with phenomena. And so that's why I wanted to do this session, to let you know that even though we're having a change in our science standards, um, that we're always open to learning new ways um, of presenting material to kids. And this is a great way to do that. It's not advancing, here we go. And so I found this quote from National Research Council that I wanted to start with that says, anchoring learning and explaining phenomena support student agency for wanting to build science and engineering knowledge. Students are able to identify an answer to, why do I need to learn this before they even know what this is? And so the idea is to make a shift from learning about science, like learning facts, to figuring out how something works or why something happens. So that's the idea for doing this. And you can do this by starting uh, with a phenomenon as an anchoring part of your lesson. And a phenomenon is just an observable event that occurs in the world that you can ask questions about and experiment to try to figure out what's going on. And so just some basic ideas here, if your science content is learning what a chemical reaction is, your phenomenon could be showing them a picture of rust on a bicycle where parts of the metal have uh, been eaten away and they have to experiment to figure out uh, why the metal um, is being corroded. And for photosynthesis, the classic phenomenon is starting with an acorn and you have a big picture of an oak tree. Where did all the stuff come from, all the matter? Um, lots of misconceptions about that and then that's always a good phenomenon to use. And so teaching this way is uh, called using a storyline. And so the idea of a storyline is that it's a sequence of lessons where each step is driven by student questions generated from their interaction with that initial phenomenon. And the goal of it is for them to be able to explain it themselves to solve a problem or to make a model that shows you that they have a deep understanding. And the idea is that you weave science content while they're using science and engineering practices and pointing out those cross-cutting concepts when they show up. So there's four basic steps. Uh, engage with the phenomenon by asking questions, and that's what we're gonna focus on today. Then ideally that the students design an investigation to find out more about the phenomenon. Uh, they analyze data and that they create some kind of model or explanation to show you that they understand what's going on. And so we're, I'm just going to have a lot of examples here for you to see about what's a scientific phenomenon. So here it can just be a picture, and you can just simply start by asking questions. What do you wonder about this image of the sun? Because um, this is not what you typically see 
uh, when you look at the sun. So I'm not going to explain very many of these phenomena at all. It's just a matter of it's a way to ask questions. And so ideally, they should be relevant, that they're somehow connected to their everyday lives or some kind of experience that they've already had, and that they inspire them to ask questions. Um, those of you that teach elementary, um, students are really good at asking questions. Um, your task is usually to keep them targeted to the science and not just any question. <laughs> but once they get to secondary, they stop being curious. And so this, this is a good way to have them get better at asking those questions. And one place to look for phenomena that you could talk about are things that are in current events. And so Devonchi is going to put some links in the chat but you're also going to get the slide deck from this for where do I go to find something that's a current event in science. And so I put some links to my favorite places. My first one is the Science News for Students. My second favorite place to find stuff is actually on Twitter. And so this is my feed from my Twitter accounts. So you can see I'm following all of these science news accounts that keeps me informed about things that are currently happening that I might be able to put in a lesson or use in the classroom. Um, and so I've got some of them that we're going to use here. So here's how you could introduce a phenomenon. Then you have a picture here of a sea turtle and something's going on. And so you can ask kids to either do a driving question board, which I've done a whole workshop just on that, or you can have them write in their interactive science notebooks, just have a chart with what I notice and what I wonder. And so does anyone have a question about what's going on in this picture that you might want to share with the group? Like I said, you can type in the chat or you can unmute and say it out loud. No one has any questions about what's going on in the picture. I find that hard to believe. <laughs> we have a volunteer. Anything in the chat, Devanchi? What is in the syringe? That's a good question. What are they feeding the turtle? I wonder if he's sick. Okay, I'm pulling these up. So very good questions. They're feeding the turtle something that's white. And I wonder if the turtle's getting medication. That's another good question. And you can even give the kids more information. Like you can tell them what's in the syringe and then they're gonna have even more questions. So that's what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna tell you that they're feeding that turtle mayonnaise. So why on earth would they feed this baby turtle some mayonnaise? And then for you, when could you use this in your classroom? How does mayonnaise help him? So could we talk about maybe properties of mayonnaise? What kind of, what is it? Um, what's in the mayonnaise that the turtle might need? These are all great questions. And so we could talk about, is mayonnaise a pure substance or is it a mixture? all kinds of science behind what's in there. But this is a real life event, uh, happened recently in Israel. And they have all these sea turtles that obviously needed some kind of rescue and they're feeding all of them mayonnaise. So I'm not gonna tell you why, <laughs> just so you can know how students feel. And you want them to still be curious. You don't want this to be something where they can um, know the answer right away, that they're going to have to do something to figure out. And maybe learning about the properties of mayonnaise might help them learn why they're using it, uh, on the, why they're feeding it to these sea turtles. So I'm going to move to the next one now, just to show you current events. This is something that showed up on my Twitter feed today. So it was perfect spot to do an example. Infectious bacteria force host plants to feed them, study finds. So what content would this help you introduce? Because that's the idea is you want to introduce some kind of science content with a phenomenon. So what could you be studying when this article might be something good for them to look at? Viruses, okay. 
bacteria and viruses, symbiosis, food webs, host parasite, I'll say all good things here. Um, and so the idea again is when you introduce this, not to solve the problem for them, but for sometimes in biology, you can't really do an experiment like you could with properties of uh, mixtures like we could with mayonnaise, but they can do more research to find out and be able to show you a model of what's going on. Interactions and ecosystems are really good answers here. So if they're having trouble coming up with questions, so I put this here as having trouble getting started, you can have some sample questions uh, for them in case they don't know what to put, what do I wonder? And so these are just examples of questions. Uh, do you wonder where this happened? Do you notice something you can't explain? Just a set of questions for uh, observations, reflections, and, and more questions. And as the teacher, you want to start with the standard because you know what content you're going to be covering. Um, it's nice to find something like I did today about the, the, uh, the bacteria and the plants, but if that's not what I'm covering today, I can't use it. And so you have to start with the standard. And so I know we probably have teachers here online from Texas and Florida. I pulled in comparable standards on density because that's what I'm going to be covering with this phenomenon. And so I have to choose a phenomenon that's somehow based on density. And so here's one that I picked. It's got a little movie that I'm going to show you. stop it real quick. So what do you notice here? What do you wonder? And this is something that they could take their questions and develop some kind of experiment to do. So what are some good questions here? Does it matter what kind of marker you use, do you think? Do we need to know what the liquid is? Right, what liquid is that? And so could you set up an experiment where they have different kind of markers and different kind of liquid? And this is done, I think, on like transparency film, um, but you could use um, anything, really. You could do it on a, on a um, styrofoam plate. I don't think it has to be something um, fancy here. But you want to make sure that they write down what they notice, what they wonder, and you can try to steer them toward doing it um, themselves. Can you recreate the scenario? And how did the liquid make the marks move? Um, I, you had a hint because I told you what the standard was, but the students don't know what the standard is. And so you're leading them to an investigation based on density. And so, of course, what makes them float is that the marker has is made of something that's less dense than the liquid. Um, and so you start with the standard, they don't know what the standard is. Um, and then they, fig they figure out by the end, by doing experiments, uh, how this worked. Here's another uh, phenomenon that you could use as an example for uh, introducing density. I'm sure we've all done this in the classroom before, but you know that a can of Coke will sink and a can of Diet Coke will float and pictures work just fine if you don't wanna set this up yourself in your classroom. Or here's another one on density. So what's going on here? The top picture actually has a divider that's been pulled out to show the bottom picture. So what can you tell me about these liquids? Anyone have something to share here? What can you tell me about the colored liquids? Okay, blue liquid is more dense. Okay, and someone has done this before, so I'm not going to address uh, how this works <laughs> just yet. Um, and I have another one. These liquids are made of the same substance. 
So they're not different liquids. And so we've probably done this. And so it's very obvious to you what the difference in these liquids are, but you can have the kids experiment to find out how could you have two liquids that are the same substance and um, have them one float on top of each other. Um, I, I can see everyone telling me that they're different temperatures, which is correct, but you want to lead the kids to an investigation where they figure it out themselves, not just to tell them the answer. And so now what I'm going to do is show you a phenomenon and then have you, um, at least in your mind, guess what content standard could I cover with this or what science content would this be covering? So this is a good one. This is one you could use with kids at a lower grade level, probably. And so what would be the science content standard that you would cover here, right? Phase changes. I see people putting that answer in there. And so we cover this at multiple grade levels. Um, so I just put some examples here from Florida and from Texas. Uh, this is going to be new. Uh, the new third grade one that matched better than one that was there currently. And also uh, for those of you teaching middle school in Texas, um, you're gonna have to talk about the um, shape, volume and kinetic energy of molecules starting when we use our new TEKS. And so now we have another biology one here. What do you notice here and what do you wonder? What is this? Anyone a bird person here to know what kind of bird this is? <laughs> Two different colors of plumage, that's true. That's true. This is a cardinal. Do we know something about, um, right, is it male or female? That's a very good question. <laughs> because what's weird about this, is it a she or a he? That's correct. Um, so kids may know that male cardinals are red and female cardinals are brown. They're not as brightly colored. So what is this and what is going on? And so rather than talk about what this is, which I'll answer your question, but you would wanna lead kids through a series of understanding the science behind it, but what content could you cover showing this cardinal that appears to be half male and half female? Genetics, traits, good. But there's something wrong with this bird, right? This is not a normal coloration for a cardinal. So what would this be a good introduction to, an example of? Mutations, there we go, there we go. And so it can show uh, mutations. Um, and that, so we have a, a teak in biology here in Texas and also a Florida standard. Uh, birds are different than people when it comes to their sex chromosomes, that you know that in females we have XX and XY in male, um, but we have Zs and Ws in birds. So there's a pigeon in the example, but all birds work the same way, just like all people would work the same way. And so if both of your chromosomes are the same, you're male. If they're different, you're female. It's a little bit opposite of people. But what is going on is that for some reason, part of the cells in that cardinal are ZW and part of them are ZZ. So these would show red, these would show brown. And so you call this um, sometimes a chimera, or a mosaic, uh, but when this happens in uh, birds, it happens a lot in insects and some invertebrates like lobsters. Um, they're called a gynandomorph, which literally means they're half male and half female. There have been chimeras with people. Um, I just remember a show I saw one time about a lady who um, was trying to get uh, like Medicaid benefits for her kids and they made her do a paternity or a a genetic test and the test showed that the kids weren't hers. 
Then she had another baby and they tested it right in the delivery room and it said the baby wasn't hers. And it turns out that she would had a mosaic that they were just different X chromosomes and um, it didn't match the, the test that they gave to the kids. So weird things happen in genetics is the lesson there. So now what is this? What do you notice here? This is a good one for what do you notice? So you can point out, what do you see here on top of this structure? What are these? There's the trees. And what is this white stuff? I see snow, snow on the top. So what is this? Someone says lava, that's what it looks like. Okay, someone has seen this picture before. <laughs> so, um, that we don't usually see lava coming out of a snow-topped um, area, that the whole area around it would have been melted. Um, this is melting snow coming down the side here. And so why is it orange? It has to do with the time of day. Um, that you see that, but you don't want to tell kids the answer right away. And so you would have to explain how that light can be refracted and bent when it hits certain molecules like a prism or dust in the atmosphere or water dripping down um, the side of a structure. So this is a good one. Um, and then you teach about the light and then you go back and they're able to explain what's going on in the picture that you can um, go back. I don't know if you let me go back and have them label what's going on here. What's the angle of the light coming in? What's happening? What's making it bend um, at the end of the lesson? Um, and here's another video. I think it's the last one that we'll show. So think about what you can teach with this short video as the phenomenon introduction. So again, the kids would talk about what they noticed, what do they wonder? You could teach Newton's laws, absolutely. What else could you teach? Some more Newton's law, friction, unbalanced forces, absolutely. Force in motion, so you all are on the same track, of course, that you could also compare volumes of the um, balloon before and after. And then of course, you could do potential kinetic energy. Um, I have law of conservation of energy. I have uh, balanced and unbalanced forces here. There are far more standards that you could cover, but I didn't want to put more than this on one slide. So just to give an idea. And then an another one for younger grades, you could do this even as far down as kindergarten. Um, they might just have to tell you what they notice and wonder versus write it down. Um, but what is this? So you can just talk about what you notice. I notice it has some claw looking things here. So yeah, I notice that it's webbed. And so here, does the flap bend down so the toenails are useful? A web-footed mammal. So how do we know it's a mammal? Do you see something up here that makes you think it's a mammal? These are all great. And so these, of course, are, are pictures like this you could use to introduce a structure and function that I started in second grade, but you can go back earlier than that. And I just wanted to point out another structure. This picture is a little bit blurry, but the same animal, the males have a giant claw right here, sort of at the base of the limb, and it is filled with venom. So these animals are one of the few venomous mammals uh, in existence, and you probably figured out it was a duck-billed platypus. They have all kinds of weird things, the venomous, uh, Claw is only one of them. <laughs> and so um, 
It's a good way to teach kids uh, how to classify and why scientists had a hard time classifying what a duckbill platypus is, because it doesn't have features like other mammals other than it has some hair, but it has a lot of other features that make it seem not like a mammal. And then this one, this terrified Devanchi when we were doing the, uh, the walkthrough for this. So this is a giant spider web covering several trees, shrubs, and the ground all around it. For those of you in, in the Dallas area, you'll probably be horrified to know this was close to you. This was taken at Lake Tawakini State Park, which is a little bit east of Dallas. Uh, this is not one spider web. Um, and so why would this happen? What do you notice about it? Probably have lots of questions about what's going on here. Why would this happen? This is not normal. <laughs> How to get as far away as possible. There's a bunch. It's really creepy. Okay. So um, animals like spiders don't do things or have behavior like this for no reason. Okay, must be a lot of insects. That's a good guess there. Food source increased. Okay. This is done as a response for something. And so I would use a phenomenon like this. Uh, where's the predator? Not a high traffic area. That's probably true. Although it looks like there's a path here. I don't think I would walk down it, but <laughs> it looks like it's there. That this is a trait they do in response to something in their environment. This is what these spiders will do when they're exposed to very heavy rain, that there's more than 12 species of spiders that all work together to make that big giant web and they share food with each other, which is not normal spider behavior. But if it's raining so hard that your one tiny web is not gonna hold up to the rain, then it benefits you to work. It's kind of like hunting in packs that uh, killer whales would do, that they're hunting in packs when they do this. A lot creepier, but um, that's what they're doing. And so again, in biology, it's a little bit harder to lead this toward an investigation, but you can lead kids to an understanding of why animals do what they do, how the environment or the abiotic factors affect animal behavior. Um, and about that some traits are behavioral traits instead of physical traits. Okay, Kelly thinks this is even more concerning. I don't know which part, the spiders or <laughs> something else I said. So, um, but always a good example when you have something creepy. So hunting in packs now, yeah, I agree, I agree. <laughs> um, and I was telling Devanchi as a kid, I grew up in the Dallas area and I don't know how many times we went camping at Lake Tawakini. Um, I never saw that, thank goodness, but um, I, I've been there a lot. So here, what do you notice about this? And what do you wonder? What is this is what I would wonder. What is this? And what would this phenomenon be a good thing to introduce in science? Looks like a ribbon, looks like ice. Okay, very good uh, observations here. So I can see there's this part of the picture, a cotton ball. I don't know if you can see my mouse when I move it, Devonshi, can you? Okay, so this is also a clue here. What is all this? Crystals, plant mutations, cotton balls, all, all good things. Um, and so I would show this picture when I wanted to talk about something about plants. So some of you that teach life science or biology will recognize the picture here, but this has to do with phase changes. So the same sort of teaks I pulled in first, or you can talk about plant structures like xylem, changes water undergoes when it changes states. So what do we know about liquid water, which is what is inside the tree in the xylem? What happens to it when it freezes? When liquid water freezes? It expands, turns to ice. And so that's what happens with some of the, it won't happen in the trunk of the tree, but in smaller areas, like let me go back to the picture real quick small thin branches, 
um, there's, it happens usually in the autumn before it gets super cold. And so there's still liquid water running through the plant. The ground is usually has not been frozen yet, but the air hits below freezing. And what happens is it freezes the liquid that's in the xylem and the stem, and it bursts the whole stem open, and it forms these structures that they call frost flowers. Not all plants do this, but there are a few plants that do it. So it's really kind of cool. So they make beautiful um, pictures like this. So you can just look up frost flower if you want other ones. So now I gave you a lot of examples of how to introduce a lesson with an anchoring phenomenon. And so now I wanna give you an example of an entire lesson. So this one would be done in middle school or high school. Um, it's just where I had more examples of student work that I could show you. And so you could start your lesson with showing kids or having on hand two different kinds of soap, one made from olive oil and one made from coconut oil. And if this picture was taken washing your hands with each of these two types of soap, and so do you notice anything, have any questions? Um, is even making a lot of bubbles something that you would want your soap to do? So the, this is the anchoring phenomenon, is either showing them pictures of the soap or having them actually wash their hands with two different kinds of soap, which would be better. Some of the standards, um, the sixth grade one in Texas about evidence of a chemical change. And then we have some in Florida and Texas about differentiating between physical and chemical changes. So we're gonna be focusing on that standard. And these are some student artifacts on, that I've found about what did they notice, what did they wonder? And so I've just transcribed what was actual student work. Um, they actually did this with three different kinds of soaps, but I was trying to make it simpler for my example. And so I just used two. And so these are things that students might write down, what I notice, what I wonder. And I want you to pay attention to the progression of student thought as you go through the lesson. Here's some others. Um, so B was more better. But they have some good questions. What makes soap harder? How do you get soap soft? These are great questions. And so you can have the kids actually make their own soap. Um, I've done this before. Um, I don't think I would do it in elementary school just because of the ingredients. And even in middle school, you may want to make sure you control the lye and not let kids uh, near it. Um, but soap doesn't have that many ingredients if you just want plain soap um, that you can add things to make it pretty, like the color. Um, but the soap itself mainly just has lye, water, and some kind of fat. Um, and so you can buy uh, powdered mica to put in for coloring. You can buy it at a craft store. Sometimes they even have it at Walmart. And you need something for a mold. Uh, back when I used to do this every year with kids, I would just use empty soup cans. Um, and you can take the, uh, you can just pour it in. And then when it's time to get it out, you can take the bottom of the can off too and just push it out and you can cut it with a knife. But you can use a cardboard milk carton, cut off one side so it looks kind of like a boat or yogurt containers. Uh, I've seen teachers use Pringles cans because you can get smaller uh, bars of soap with those. Um, so you can get more per recipe. And so uh, when you get the slide deck, I also have two different recipes you can use for soap. Again, the ingredients, there are not a lot unless you wanna add um, essential oils for, for smell or something for color. They have water and you should use distilled water. They have lye, which you can buy at anywhere, grocery store, and they have some kind of fat. And so our, ours here is using um, olive oil. And so I have a recipe that makes about 12 bars of soap. Um, and I also have a coconut oil recipe that also makes about 12 bars, thinking that if you made one of each, that that might be enough for every kid in class to, to have one bar of soap. And so I have the measurements here for what you would need if you wanted to make this. I also have directions on how to actually make the soap if you haven't done it before. Um, the lye, when you add it to water, needs to be done in a well-ventilated area that you could even go outside to do this and then bring it back in if you don't have ventilation. People do it in their houses all the time. I've made soap at home before, too. Just be careful with the lye. 
And then you have kids write down some data um, so they can record properties and observations that you tell them what kind of oil that you're using that um, olive oil has a more scientific name. It's mostly oleic acid. Coconut oil is mostly lauric acid. There are some other fatty acids in there, but just to try to simplify. And you can have them write down properties of their density, solubility, their melting point. Um, you can go to chemspider.com to look all these up, which is good for them to do. And then they compare it with the, these properties of the product after they make the soap. And then identify whether a chemical reaction occurred and how would you know? And so here's a sample data table with all those numbers and they can look and see these numbers changed. Um, so a chemical reaction occurred. So do some data analysis, just a picture of what some of their soap might look like. They wanted to make different colors. And then to reinforce the idea that structure determines function, because for this one, we wanna get them to explain or get to where they can understand a model of how soap works. So do they need to know how to replicate these structures or to test them on these structures on a test? No, of course not. You just want them to understand this cross-cutting concept that structure determines function. So they know that if you add water to lye, which is sodium hydroxide, and you add fatty acid, like the coconut oil, that you can make soap and water. So as a waste product. So how does soap actually work? Um, and so I put an analogy here, just like some people run away screaming when a wasp flies into a room. Maybe I should put when you run into a giant web of spiders instead. <laughs> some molecules also avoid other molecules because they have properties that don't, they don't like to mix together. So when a soap molecule, the tail part, the long tail fatty acid part does not want to be next to water, but the head of the soap doesn't mind being next to water. And so these are properties that um, you need to understand to make soap work. And so I've done this with a modeling game where I've divided the kids into three groups and said, this third, you're the water group, your soap heads, your soap tails, and here are the rules. If you're, a if you're water, you cannot stand next to a soap tail, but you have no problem being next to a soap head. If you're a soap head, you can interact with any other molecule, but you also help keep the soap tails away from the water. And if you're a soap tail, you have to stay away from water, but you have to stay attached to a soap head um, because that's how it works. And so you can either have the kids um, line up and make a human model, which I've done, or you can work with the group to have them draw a model or the next slide, I have example of how you can cut out pieces of all these things, but they have to follow the rules to make a model of how they think this works. That you have to have at least eight soap heads and eight soap tails and eight water molecules, and the soap tails in the water cannot come into contact with each other, and the soap heads have to stay attached to the soap tails. So here I have eight water eight soap heads, eight soap tails. And I've printed these out and kids can cut them apart and try to make a model that way. And then end up drawing a picture that might look like this. So these are some models that kids have made on how they think this works. This one has a water molecule in the middle, a soap head and soap tails coming out. This one has a bunch of water in the middle, close to soap head with soap tails pointing out, which shows that they understand the rules. This one, they did it backwards. They have the soap heads here facing out with water around it and all the soap tails going in the center. This one does too. And so not everyone got the gist of how this works um, because they have not been exposed to drawing models or really understanding how science works. So now I'm gonna add some more structural knowledge that it turns out that the soap tails of coconut oil, here, here's the head, here's the tail, they look very different. So could this have something to do with the fact that olive oil soap and coconut oil soap don't make the same amount of bubbles? And hopefully they say yes. And so now <laughs> you're gonna compare, can the structure of the tails explain the difference in the number of bubbles produced? So I put the picture back here again, olive oil soap does not make very many bubbles, but coconut oil soap makes a lot more bubbles. So can you refine 
your drawing, your model to explain why you have different numbers of bubbles with these two kinds of soap. And so here they don't quite have it, but they've got the gist of it, that they understand that the coconut oil soap, the fatty acid tails are more in a line and that the zigzag tails of olive oil soap, they think it could slow down the reaction time. So they're revising that model. And so when you show this actual structure of a soap bubble, they're gonna understand what you're talking about where they might not have if you hadn't gone through this. That of course the soap bubble has air in the middle which wasn't part of your model, so, but that's okay. And that the water in a soap bubble is in between two layers of soap molecules, all with the heads facing the water and all with the tails facing out. And it is true that you're gonna have better bubbles when these soap molecules can pack more closely together instead of the zig, uh, you know, the change in shape of that um, olive oil soap. So any questions about that before we wrap this up with how to move the kids toward making a model? That's what I wanted to have an example of here. I realize that not everyone can make soap and you certainly can't talk about structures of fatty acids with all of your kids, but I wanted to have a concrete example with some student artifacts here that being able to make a model and understand a model of what's going on is really important uh, for kids to be able to understand. It helps them explain what can't be seen, like forces or the movement of particles. And even making a labeled drawing of um, something is a model for them to understand. Um, so it doesn't always have to be. In high school, when you write a formula for a chemical reaction, that's a model. Um, it's just a different kind of model. So here we can go back and say, after we've learned about density, can you draw a model of how the Coke inside of the Coke can looks different than the inside of the Diet Coke can? And their model should show the same volume, but fewer particles, right, in the Diet Coke can. And so that's why it has um, a lower density than the can of Coke. So that should be easy for kids to make a model of. Or this one. Can you draw a model of what the inside of the balloon looks like? How does it look now compared to how it looked at the end? Or can you sh have a force diagram showing me the before and after here? Um, that's also a model showing that they understand what's going on. Or here, can you draw a model that explains why those drawings float on water? Again, go into, um, you know, use their super spy eyes, get in really, really close so they can show you what the actual particles are doing. And here, um, this is when you can go back and once they understand that these samples of water are at different temperatures, how do you know they're at different temperatures? What would the molecules in the red water look like compared to the blue? It's all water, but these molecules are going to be arranged differently than the ones that are more dense. And so they need to be able to draw a model. I think, oh yeah, and this one too. Um, especially when we get to middle school and they have to explain the kinetic energy of these. Can you draw a model to explain what's happening? Um, and just a reminder, here that a good anchoring phenomenon should build on something in their everyday life. That's why I picked that lesson about washing your hands with soap, that it requires them to develop scientific understanding while they're doing reading, writing, communicating, math, uh, doing some kind of science lab. It should be something that's too complicated to explain or to look up an answer on Google. It can be a case study, like what happened to the pine beetles, or why aren't my bath bombs working, or something that's puzzling. If uh, water evaporates from the ocean, why isn't it salty? Um, or just wonder, how did the solar system form for some of these larger things? Or, or why do duck-billed platypus, why do they have a poison claw, the males anyway, on their back legs? And then it needs to have some kind of relevant data, pictures or text, so that they can build that understanding over time. Anybody have any questions or comments? I think I'm right on time at ending the presentation part. So all we have left here are the questions.
So my last slide is just, oh, I forgot. I have more resources if you want to know more. Again, you're going to get the slide deck. I have some, um, some more stuff on phenomena. The Iowa Science has a ton of stuff on phenomena, but it's all local, um, things that are in Iowa. Um, but it might give you ideas for things you could do here. And then just talking more about storylines, if this is a concept that is also new to you. And for those of you who don't know how to get a hold of me, um, I'm just Lisa at edgesmart.com, and I'm more than happy to answer questions if you think about it after the webinar that I'm chained to my computer all day long every day. So <laughs> I will see your email. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. Thanks for your participation in this. There's a lot of stuff in the, um, in the chat, so I appreciate that. And hopefully you have a better idea of what a phenomenon is and how to use it to start learning and then also how to build that thinking into doing some kind of lab and moving into making a model mm -hmm. or a drawing, you know, just something to show you that they understand the concept. Well, thank you so much, yeah. Lisa. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, before we enter our Q&A, which we have about eight minutes to go through, I just wanted to answer a lot of your questions that are coming in directly to me right now. Uh, some of you had, uh, due to logging in issues, were joining our webinar a little bit late. I will make sure to fix that for our next round. But for today, if you did come in late, do not worry. Early next week, you'll be receiving an email from me in which there will be not only a recording of this webinar, but a copy of Lisa's slide deck. So if there's anything you missed, you will be able to catch up with there. But with that, do we have any questions for Lisa um, at this moment? You can either put it in the chat and I'll read it out to her, or feel free to unmute yourself. It sounds like they're not too many. I did a good job that. of explaining it. You That's were so I good. There were just no <laughs> questions. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. It's a huge yeah. round of applause for you. Thank you so much for putting. I know all of you all in the audience were very engaged because I saw your faces when you saw the platypus's paw and your face was the same as mine. As in, is that a moose's hand? whose foot is that we were all making the same impression so i know you all are engaged so thank you so yeah. much for joining us on your busy uh evenings after a full day of work thank you so much lisa for putting together sure. this presentation you want to have... remind them what's coming next we have a brilliant idea so up next we actually have <laughs> guest presenters coming yes. and joining us on wednesday april the 27th and this presentation is very unique because they will be talking about building a strong science foundation for special education dyslexia, ELL, through the use of explicit science instruction. So I'm going to copy the link and I'll put it in the chat, but I will also make sure to email you all that information. Um, and these guest speakers are experts in this field and would love to chat yeah. with you about this in great detail. Yeah, they're great speakers. So... Absolutely. So we hope to see you all in, on April uh, 27th. Until then, I hope you all enjoy the beginning of spring and <laughs> enjoy your weekend. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you again, Lisa. Yeah, thank you for coming.